Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. We are studying the book of Proverbs, and we are in Proverbs chapter 30, and we are beginning this morning in verse 10. These are the thoughts, the words of a very wise man, Agur, that we are studying, and we have found him to be most profitable to us. Uh, Before I begin and read the scriptures this morning, let me uh, also announce next week, we will not be meeting in here. We will be meeting in the auditorium and we are so fortunate and so blessed to have Dr. G.K. Beale uh, teaching us uh, next week. You know, it's, uh, it's really a very profound thing that uh, uh, a man like Dan Duncan and Believer's Chapel can attract such noteworthy scholars across the country. And you're certainly blessed to have, in my opinion, some of the great minds and great teachers of this day and this time. So please don't forget that. Uh, Get your tickets early and your seats uh, quickly and uh, be prepared to hear Dr. Beal at this time next week. Okay, Uh, Proverbs chapter 30 beginning in verse 10 this morning. Do not slander a slave to his master, otherwise, or perhaps you have lest he may curse you and you become liable. Now, when we come to verse 11, 11 through 14, what we have is a a series of observations by this wise man of a generation of wicked characteristics. And so uh, I'm going to give you this translation. You may not have it, and I'll discuss that in the exposition itself. But here is this translation that I think is accurate and very, commendable to you for your consideration. Verse 11, a generation, they curse their fathers, do not bless their mothers. 12, a generation, they are pure in their own eyes, but are not cleansed from their filth. 13, a generation, how they raise their eyes and how they lift their eyelids. 14, a generation, their teeth are swords and their jawbones are butcher knives to devour the poor, eliminate them from the earth and the needy from humanity. Now, he is going to move from that observation, and those verses 11 through 14 are connected, and they're going to morph now into another observation of wickedness. Uh, This generation of wickedness, it is going to have the theme of frustrations frustrations in life, frustrations on the earth that he has observed. Beginning in verse 15. The leech has two daughters. Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Four that never says enough. And then 16. Sheol and the barren womb the land that is never satisfied with water and fire, which never says 
enough. What is this wise man pondering? Because all the scriptures are profitable for teaching, for correction, for the rule of righteousness. Look at these amazing observations of the wise man. Well, we must make sense of them. And that is my job to you this morning. Beginning in verse 10, he opens with, do not slander. That's a single line proverb of a guru, again, reminding us all his mention of lies and deceit, which came to us originally in verse 8. I love the way that this man speaks. I love the way that he writes. I love the way that he prays. Very clear with exclamation points, and I will point those out to you. At the end of his imperatives, this is man does not mumble around, oh, bless all the missionaries in Africa tonight. Amen. No. This man is very precise, exact, and he makes his requests be made known to God. He's focused, and here it is. Do not slander. Now that's used throughout the Proverbs of speaking negatively about an individual to hurt or harm a reputation. Usually done with the without the absence of that person or personality in our midst. It is to hurt. It is to devalue. Often it's used of a fool who makes up false representations. Here's Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 18. The one who hides or conceals with lying lips and utters slander is a fool. There it is. Black and white. It's foolish behavior. It should not be mentioned among us. Now, I want you to observe carefully the sensitivity of this wise man. Because he is actually protecting here a slave against such an abusive attack. Now, why is that significant? Because a slave has no rights. A slave has no representation, no place of appeal whatsoever. This is a sensitive man toward people, no matter where the Lord in His providence stacked them, placed them. Here it is, Genesis 39, 14. Potiphar's wife called the servants of her household and said, See how Potiphar has brought among us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to sleep with me, but I shouted out in a loud voice her testimony. This is a woman, a paragon of virtue. The prohibition in the proverb here is taking advantage of the weaker person. He has no place to appeal. He is, by status, a weaker person. That's his point. He has no credibility whatsoever. So, wisdom says, you be careful how you treat people. No matter where they are, they are all placed in the providence of God, and we are to handle people with care. In Godfather, now you know I'm a depraved individual when I mention the Godfather for an illustration, don't you? Well, in the script, the Godfather, there is a conversation going on between two scurrilous individuals. One is Hyman Roth, who represented the well-known living Meyer Lansky. And in his arrogance in this conversation, 
He called the New York gangster Frank Pantangeli small potatoes. I never forgot that. Small potatoes. Dismiss him whatsoever. Not important. That's the idea. And that's the proverb here. You don't do that with people. Line two, the one who is cursing could be either a slave or a master to the slave. The proverb isn't clear. Cuts both ways. Here's what is clear. And here is the wisdom that we all need to embrace. Don't curse. Don't revile another. Either the oppressor or the perpetrator doesn't make any difference. Say nothing. That's the idea. You make up the lie, the slander against the defenseless. And here's the proverb. The God of divine providence will come and act against you. Fear the Lord, my friends. That's the beginning of wisdom. In providence, he will act. Notice the close. Now, here's my translation. It might not be yours, but it is become a liability. Remember the word become. It's not one. It's not two. Become is between. It's a transition word. Read the scriptures that way. Let the Word of God bathe your mind. Think carefully through the words that are used. You are becoming a liability by what you said. It falls upon the fool. It is righteous retribution. Now, you know, I've always wondered, just exactly on that sunshiny day in Egypt, when Mrs. Potiphar heard about Joseph's exaltation, you know, if there ever was a Toby Keith moment in the Bible. How do you like me now? When they're spinning him around all of Egypt and he's got Pharaoh's ring on his hand. Where was she at that moment? I think like that. Perhaps she was in the kitchen. Perhaps she was at that time holding one of the household idols. And Hearing it, she gasped and dropped the idol, and it broke into a hundred pieces on the floor. Perhaps she fainted on the spot. All of the slaves of the household that she had lied to had to carry her to a pillow, put cold compress on her forehead. Or, or perhaps... She just screamed out loud. Like Genesis 39, 14, when she screamed about her lie. We don't know. It's just pure speculation. But here's what we do know. Her lie, says the proverb, has become a liability. Become. You see, nothing is ever going to remain the same for her. She'll never be at peace. Why, well, he could have me arrested. He could cart me off to Pharaoh's prison. He's all-powerful. No one questions Joseph in the land, second only to Pharaoh. She'll never have another good night's sleep, always sleeping with one eye open. Always hearing a crack or a creak in the house. Is that Joseph? Has he come? Is he arresting me? Her lie has become the liability for her life. And that's the proverb. Jesus, 
Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37. By your words you will be justified, and by your own words you will be condemned. Now we move to a series of numerical sayings. This is why we pay attention to style when we look at the Proverbs. The style, the way that the writer wrote it. He wrote it with a specific intent, with a specific purpose in mind. The King James, I think, has the best translation. There is a generation. That word may not be in your translation of the Old Testament. You may have the word those or the word kind. The Greek translation of the Old Testament is a wicked generation. The real translation question here is, is this an individual or is this a specific place or time? <clears throat> is it a type of person or is it the prevailing society that we live through? I think it is the society that we live through. I think it is a reference to the time. Specifically, here is the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, in the last days, grievous times shall come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, railers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, etc. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, that's certainly our day and our time. I don't know. I, I walked down the hall of a hotel with Dr. Bruce Walkie about 10, 12 years ago. And we were talking about the subject of the debauchery of our society. And he and I was saying, it just can't get much worse. And he stopped me and corrected me and said, oh, be sure of this, it will get worse. And it has. It has. You know, I read the opening chapter in Volume 1, George Dalamore's Life of George Whitfield. I close that first chapter, page after page after page, of the times that God raised up the young Whitfield. And I thought, well, that's, that's Dallas, Texas. That's where we are now. No, no. It's far from where we are now. And so the apostle says, know this, it's going to get worse. It's the madness of the mob. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 3. There is an evil that is done under the sun that the same event happens to us all. The children of men are evil and full of madness. Think about that. Madness. Why, well, nothing makes sense. It's horrible what's going on. Our great institutions are caught in lies, and they just dismiss them like we are some blind idiots not thinking. Perhaps we are blind idiots, but it is what's happening, and it is our society today. So the idea of the word generation is a collection. And that is represented if you have your translation, kind or those. It's a black and white world for this man. Verse 11, they curse their fathers, they don't bless their mothers. A generation, pure in their own eyes, but not cleansed from their filth. Nothing in the gray. This is 
This is the way it is. Nothing to blend in. Verse 13, a generation here. We have what amounts to an exclamation in English. They raise their eyes. They lift their eyelids. Verse 14, a generation, their teeth, their swords, jaw bones, jaw teeth, says the King James. The NASV has a comparison. It uses the word like, a knife to devour. It's the common word to eat. It's a macabre sight. It is them devouring, eating the flesh of people. It is degeneration. And all from our humanity, all from our times and places. Well, here's the exposition. Um, and we need to remember when we talk about light and darkness, when we talk about that there is no gray with this man of wisdom, nothing to blend into, that you and I are under the command of the Lord Jesus. We are to walk in the light as He is in the light. That's John 1.17. Jesus Christ reproduced in you and me by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the instrumentality of the Word of God. And we are walking according to His Word. And if we are doing so, the Lord Jesus said, we are letting our life shine before others. We should be different. We think differently. We act differently. We are not caught up in the wisdom of this age, this time. We are caught up with Christ. And we are to live out our lives as a living representative of Him. Trust Him in all things. All things. And believe me, as the Scriptures here, the exposition is going to show you will come out the winners of your life. Winners over your generation. Here's verse 11. Fathers and mothers, who throughout the book of Proverbs have actually been in tandem teaching in the home. But look, a generation that fails to honor their parents, matter of fact, not only fails to honor them, curses them. That's a capital crime in the Old Testament. Under the Mosaic Law, Exodus 21, 17. Foolish rebels, they don't bless. Bless power, potency, enriching the life. No, these children that owe everything to their parents and giving thanks, no. What do they do? They demean. They defame. Proverbs 20.20, 20, the one who curses his father or mother, his lamp will be placed in utter darkness. Think about that word. Let it absorb you. Placed. Placed by who? Placed how? Placed by divine providence and invisible hands. God is going to deal with them and He's going to plant them in utter darkness. Uh, here's the sadness. The great parent of Israel, Matthew chapter 23, 37, Jerusalem, O oh Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, stone those who sent to you. How I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. That's it. Matthew 15, 3 through 6, our Lord rebuked the practice of not honoring father and mother. We are between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Reach out and honor your parents. And if they are now gone, then thank the Lord for them. Every day, they gave you much. And you are to receive it as a blessing and appreciation. 
Verse 12, a generation pure in their own eyes. A generation that is actually covered in filth. That's what the wise man says. Here is their behavior. Well, they abort babies, but they will sound the alarm, red alert, and move heaven and earth to save a beach whale. That is uh, this generation. Pure. The word is associated with cleansing the tabernacle so that the priests and the elements that work there are free from any form of ethical contamination. Here's your cue to these and their generation of wickedness. Look at that phrase, in their own eyes. Used throughout the Proverbs, declared as an identifiable spirit. It is the portrait of the poor fool, who is even worse than the fool. Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Smug, self-confident, quick to tell you, they know, oh, I know, I know, I know. You can't tell them anything. You can't teach them anything. Matter of fact, they've gone off to the university. They've come back to tell you and to teach you. You know nothing. Line two, but there's your contrast. Not cleansed. All the waters and all the soaps in the world can't make them clean because the Word of God has declared them to be dirty. How does a man keep his way pure? Psalm 119.9 By hiding the Word of God in his heart. And that word pure there in the psalm is our same word pure here. Free from ethical contamination. Guard your heart, says the wise man, for out of it comes the issues of life. Now, here is what man has become. He has become autonomous. A-U-T-O-N-O-M-U-S. Autonomous. Look it up in Webster's. Here's, here is its definition. Self-governing. Independent. Subject to their own laws. In their own hearts, they are always right about everything. This is the self-deluded generation that calls evil good and good evil. Any man that thinks that he can make himself pure in any shape or fashion apart from the Word of God is wise in his own eyes and is self-deluded. That's what is so offensive to me about the Roman church and any form of works salvation whatsoever. God, my friends, demands purity. And what is that purity? It's not 99.9. .9. It is 100% purity. There's no equivocation. Perfection. 100 by 100. And when a man appears before the Lord Jesus, as we all will, all will, you're either going to stand on your own merits, or you are going to stand on the merits of one, and he better be perfect. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. The perfect man. The perfect substitute. That you have trusted. That you have believed Him. I go to prepare a place for you. John 14. If it were not so, I would have told you. Believe Him and believe His Word. The man who completely relies upon Him will not be found wanting. I can remember as a young man, I had only been saved a couple of years, 
when I was off to seminary and I was plying my teachers with a thousand questions, trying to absorb as much as I could of all of theology. And I can remember having lunch one day with S. Lewis Johnson, and we were talking about the doctrine of sanctification, that men would be made holy. And he suddenly startled me by saying, well, how would you define my life? Caught me off guard. He said, he answered it himself. You would define my life by sin, he said. Well, I could certainly understand defining my life by sin, but not his life by sin. But you see, that's the biblical truth. That's the horrible contamination of us all. We are all in desperate need of a Savior day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. That is the truth. I will never forget having the book of Romans with Dr. Edwin Bloom. had a great influence on me. And we came to Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. You don't need to turn there. You know the text. O oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of death? And here is what Dr. Bloom said, and I have never recovered from it. He said, that was the testimony of Saul of Tarsus when he was on the Damascus Road on his way to torture and imprison and even kill Christians. And that was the testimony of the Apostle Paul. And if we follow historic tradition, the day they put his head on a block and it rolled into a basket. Wretched man that I am, we need to be saved moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour. That is our condition. This wise in their own eyes, the Scriptures declare they're going to perish. And they're going to perish in a mighty way. I've often referenced in 1979, it was the year I graduated from the seminary, and in Christianity Today, they had the last interview with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And they advertised it that way, the final interview. And I read it very carefully, very thoroughly, and it came to the last question. Dr. Jones, do you have a final word for our readers? And he said, yes. Yes, I do. Flee the wrath to come. I think about how wicked we have become since 1979. And that wrath has been building and building and building each day. This verse, in verse 13, a generation, they raise their eyes, they lift their eyelids. It has a particle in the inspired language, and we are to translate that by putting an exclamation point at the end of line one. So, that is your English translation. It should have an exclamation. In verse 12, the wicked generation is self-deluded, but here they are described and noted for their arrogance, known for their brazen behavior, described in both lines. They raise their eyes. They lift their eyelids. Both are predicates signifying an attitude of superiority over others. They're our teachers. They're not our students. They instruct us in what to say and think and now do. The outward activity of the eyes depict the inward disposition of the heart. If there is one thing in particular that coming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it absolutely crushes your pride 
It destroys it. It obliterates it. What part of any of us is worthy of saving compared to the Son of Glory who stepped away from holy perfection and righteousness that we can't even fathom or imagine to come and to walk dusty roads and be with us only to suffer a very violent death. If that thought alone does not break you, obviously you do not understand the gospel. Look at this lifting up of the eyes. It's, I, I wish that I had more than seven minutes left to delve into that phrase. It is all over the Old Testament. I wish I had time to develop it for you. Let me just give you one reference. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10. Don't need to turn there. Lot had just lifted up his eyes to the well-watered plain down in the cities of Sodom. The context of the statement was the quarreling of the herdsmen, Lot's animals and Abram's. And so it was a quarrel over grazing rights. And Abram, the leader, is the peacemaker. Now there's something to learn from that. The leader is always the lover. He is always the initiator. He's the peacemaker. So what does the Apostle Paul admonish us? As it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So what do we make of this phrase to lift up the eyes about Lot? Well, just exactly what had Lot earned? How arrogant could he be? All the prosperity that he had was drafting off his uncle and the blessings that God had provided. Why, well, he had a built-in deal, and yet he lifts up his eyes. And the Scripture says he chose for himself. Those are important words because that means he's not guided by the Spirit of God. He's guided by his own spirit. He's lifting up his own eyes, and he's thinking for himself. Pure arrogance. Lot forgot who he was. Lot forgot where he came from. That's arrogance. Everything that he had, everything that he had, he owed to the blessing of God upon his uncle. Here is his end. His fatal flaw. His decision that day. It marked his life, and here is its end. Charles Bridges writes about it in his commentary on Proverbs. Here's his description. A poor, forlorn, degraded tenant living in a desolate cave at Zoar. Love that. A poor, forlorn, degraded tenant living in a desolate cave at Zoar. The righteous are saved by the mercy of God alone. Always know who you are and where you have come from. Here's 14. A generation, their teeth are swords, their jawbones, butcher knives, the final of the first sayings, the exploitation of the weak and the defenseless, the top line, the figures of teeth, swords, jawbones, butcher knives, to effectively communicate the insensitivity, the cruelty, the lethal activity of a generation. Line two now explains and expands the figures of speech and attitude. Here they are. They are to capitalize. They are to eliminate who? The poor, the weak among us, the defenseless. The wise are to speak up for them, but not this generation. No. The wicked generation has no use for anyone but themselves. 
people are pawns to them. So whatever they need to do to oppress them or take advantage of them, they will be sure of this, that the Lord will pay back, pay out that generation in full force. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here is 15. 15 and 16, a second parathetical thought. The leech has two daughters, give and give. First thing we want to do is look at the style. The number two is used in line one. The number two is line three. The number three is in line four. Two, three, four, style-wise considered to be maybe a list. Nothing is to be missed. Perhaps an effective use of crescendo. Who knows? That is clearly the intent of Amos, chapter 1 and verse 3. This is what the Lord says. There are three sins of Damascus, even four, and I will not relent upon them. This proverb provokes several questions. Here they are. Why a leech? Why daughters? Why two? Isn't one enough? Well, let's address them. First, the leech, known to be the blood-sucking horse leech. It's a parasite that lives in water. It attaches itself quickly and powerfully, and unless we remove it quickly, damage will be done. Second, daughters. Why not sons? Psalm 127, sons known for their strength, sons known for their ability to defend clans, family, make war. But this is daughters, perhaps well-known consumers. They don't build those big department stores for the men, do they? <laughs> Third, two. If one is demanding, then two are worse. Driving the man crazy. Look at the verb to give. Represented of each person. Why, he, she's just like her sister. I was visiting with a surgeon and uh, asking what he's going to do for the Thanksgiving holidays. He said, I'm getting in a car and I'm driving. That's what I'm doing. I'm driving. You could tell he was bitter and angry. I quizzed him. And he opened up. He had just gone through a divorce. His wife left him for a 22-year-old man, he said. I went home, told my wife. I was startled. She said, why, her sister did the same thing at the exact same age. Different in personalities, but one in the same in behavior. Now here, the second line. Into, connected into one observation through verse 16. Shield, barren woman, never satisfied. Numbers 3 and 4 are locked together by repetition of words. Satisfied and enough. Both words are defined as insatiable. They exhibit for us the extremes of life and in creation. Verse 16, shield, that dark and foreboding place called we know is the grave. And what does the Proverbs tell us about it? Never has enough. Never has enough. The morgue can be filled, but there's plenty of land for graves, whether it's mass or individual. The grave in the earth, it never is satisfied. It never has enough. Always waiting for another. And then there's the barren womb, which has its own set of pain. Trust God if you're there. God is doing something. Wait patiently for Him and trust Him in that circumstance. Rachel calling out her husband. Genesis 30, verse 1. Give me children or I die. Hannah, 1 Samuel 1.10 cries bitterly. She prayed out to the Lord for a child. Here's the third. Land that is not satisfied with water. Palestine is much like the Midwest. It needs rain. 
We have droughts. We have periods of weeks and weeks where it doesn't rain and we need it. Fire, always in need of combustible fuel and oxygen, the wind to push it forward. All of these things are never satisfied according to Agur. And so he leaves us this way to think about them, to ponder them. But I want to say to Agur, Mr. Wiseman, I got to teach a class. I got to teach a class at Believer's Chapel. I can't tell people, now you're dismissed, go out and think about barren wombs and, and land that needs rain and fire that is moved on. I've got to give them something. So here it is. I do it theologically. He's talking about observable characteristics of the earth, so let's do that. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, Romans 8, 21. He describes the fallen creation. He says it eagerly awaits the change from the present frustration that we're in. The King James uses words like bondage and decay. Well, it wasn't always that way, was it? I mean, man and the woman in the garden, they didn't have the creation that way, did they? No. But now, look at the creation as he describes it. What is it? It never has enough. It's always wanting more and more and more and more. That's what the woman wanted. She wanted more. She was promised an elevated life. What did she get? She got a frustration here and a frustration there. That's what we all clamor for. More and more and more. Never satisfied. One's not enough. Must have two. Two not enough. Must have four. Four not enough. Must have eight. Eight not enough. Must have sixteen. That's the way we think and that's the way we live. It's impressed upon us. But consider this. There is a solution and Augustine gave it to us. Man is a stir. He is restless until he rests in Thee. Christ is our satisfaction. Christ is our fulfillment. Christ is the end of the full circle. Here is Christ using the wanting words of the world. For us, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, and he'll be satisfied. That's what he brings. Peace, satisfaction, beyond anything that this world can produce or represent to you and me. Embrace him, trust him, Believe Him. Cast yourself, said Charles Spurgeon, with a reckless abandon upon Him. He will satisfy the needs of the heart and minister to your soul. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this Your Word. Guide, guard, direct us, and lead us by it, through it. Give us the wisdom that we don't possess, but comes from You, the skill for living. We need it desperately each day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.